All right, hello everyone. Um, sorry once again for the delay getting started, but today uh, we're going to be getting started with MySQL. Uh, we're just going to do some basic queries today. We won't get into any joins, and then we certainly won't get into how to connect this to Java uh, yet today. I just want to at least get us started with basic tables, queries, etc. So today the focus is going to be on SQL databases just some announcements first and foremost uh homework five now due friday was due tomorrow night pushing it back two days just because people have been having trouble finding groups with the online nature of the course i understand that additionally you can work alone starting now um if you can't find a group but if you do work alone it, consider yourself responsible for the two-person part of the assignment and still need still use github um if you're going to work alone commit early and often uh, because we will be grading uh how commits are done in terms of this project uh that is to say that if you have one very large commit and only one very large commit at the end of the assignment then we're just not you're going to lose some points. You're going to lose up to 10 points. Uh, we want to see consistent small commitments over time. We want to see you iteratively build this project. Um, that's kind of a big part of this class is the idea that you don't just sit down and code until you're finished and submit. Rather, you build it up incrementally. Uh, so that's why we're requiring GitHub for the assignment. And I just want to remind everyone up to 10 points can be lost if, if you only have one commit, one massive commit that is everything at the end um excuse me i should say push technically um so definitely try to work on it together try to have those small consistent commits and you'll find that it's just easier if you do it that way to handle um conflicts if and when they arise uh from there the goal is for exam two grades to be out um out later this week by later this week i mean hopefully tonight realistically probably tomorrow night uh there's only a couple questions left to grade and then we will get the exam out finally there will be a quiz thursday which is on json xml and sql which uh sql being what we're covering today uh any questions about any of those announcements so far i'll wait a second And um, one thing that we're going to need to do today is you're going to need to install on your own machine a MySQL uh, database. To do this, the simplest way is to simply Google MySQL installer. Uh, sorry, I missed the first minute or so. Homework 5 deadline is pushed back to Friday. That is correct. It is no longer due tomorrow night is due friday uh, and that's just because people have, have been finding it difficult to find groups um given that we are not physically meeting uh in one place so i'm trying to accommodate that however if you don't have a group at this point i would encourage you to get started all the same and you can work alone uh, but you still have the two-person requirement to the assignment um two-person uh, requirements, which is to say you will have to do the same work as a pair would have to do. Um, and you st and in addition to that, you still need to use GitHub. I just want to make sure that those are separate bullet points. Um, exam two grades, though, so far looking uh, fairly good. Again, I haven't actually decided, because we haven't graded every question yet, I haven't yet decided uh, on a curve if how if there's a curve how much there's a curve etc uh we're kind of taking a look at that um finally there will be a homework six released on thursday and i'm just going to uh let me do something here real quick there we go homework six released thursday this is not going to be a particularly large assignment Homework six, I am going to have you um, pull some data 
from a JSON file. You're then going to write a SQL source file, which we'll talk about what all this means today. Write a SQL source file that populates a database with that data. Write a second SQL source file that um, contains queries of that data. And then finally write a connection in a Java program that goes to that database to execute those queries, to pull the data and write it to a JSON file. It sounds scary when I'm throwing in all those abbreviations there, but it will be a, a relatively shorter assignment, uh, which is intended given that, um, you know, ho homework five I'm finding is turning out to be a little bit harder than I expected, not, not dramatically so. But also, um, just with, with everything going online, I've intentionally scaled back this assignment a bit. It will be an assignment that once it's released, you will have until next Friday, so the 17th to turn in. Uh, but it, it, it will be very, very doable in that period of time. Uh, it, it won't be... So if you've, if you've taken SQL at any context before, you're probably going to find this lecture really boring because I'm, I'm, I'm going very bare bones SQL and we're not doing much more than that. We're just going to get up to basically simple inner joins and that's about all we're going to have time for on this class, but it's at least worth seeing SQL. So the first thing that you'll need to do is you will need to download the MySQL installer. So if you just Google MySQL installer up here, uh, you will find it. Um, and then they have the different operating systems. So actually they only have Windows, that's strange. Um, I will I will come up with directions for Mac users. There is there is a way to set up um, MySQL on a Mac or on a Linux machine, and I will I will find uh, a good set of those directions and link them. I will find them because uh, writing them myself is not really doable since I don't have access to a Mac. Oh, there we go. Just type MySQL installer Mac. Perfectly good. Okay. Um, hey, look at that. There it is. Um, and the key is that the MySQL installer will set up the server architecture. It will set up a bunch of applications like MySQL Workbench, which we will uh, which we will be getting into today. And this is a way that you can look at your tables and things like that. We're not really going to use this too much. It's just a good way to have a visual cue. Um, and addition to that, in Windows, and I'm just gonna do, I'm just gonna show you where to do this real quick. Typically, when you install the MySQL, it's going to go in C, Program Files, and then you'll see down here MySQL, and then in MySQL Server. Oh, sorry, I didn't have this on the correct window. Um, so, again, C, Program Files, MySQL. And then MySQL Server, and then bin. This folder is very special. So here's the route to it. It's going to be the same on your computer. I don't know why it won't let me do what I want to do, which is there we go. So C, Program Files, MySQL, MySQL Server 8.0, bin. The reason you need this folder on Windows is because you have to set environment variables, which sounds scary, but it's not that bad. What you do, Go down here, type environment variables. It'll give you edit the system environment variables. Click on environment variables and then go to path. And what you need to do with path is edit. And then you need to add this address. And you'll see that I've already added it. See program files, MySQL, MySQL. Um, I actually used uh, shell, which I didn't intend to do, but sorry, MySQL server, excuse me, there it is, uh, 8.0 bin. The reason you do this is it's going to let you use MySQL from the command line and specifically from PowerShell, which of course is going to be equivalent to Mac terminal. So everything we do from here will work. So I will um, write this up in a Piazza post, but you can always go back and look at the, the replay there of how to do that uh, on Windows. Again, you set environment variable, oops, not what I'm trying to do environment variables 
click on the environment variables and then add to path the path to that um, MySQL Server 8.0 bin folder. From here, I'm actually going to go into a folder that we're going to use later today. So I'm going to CD to my documents SQL. And if you'll notice, I only have a SQL file in here, but I want to be clear, seek, this is not a database. init.sql is not a database. Rather, it is a source file that we're going to use later to get our database into a starting point. So the first thing we really want to do, actually, is take some time and talk about what exactly is a database. And I will start up here at the beginning. So again, all of this is here. Uh, and this, these slides will be uploaded. They're not uploaded yet. I do apologize. Um, from there, to get into MySQL, we use the MySQL command, uh, username, root, and then hyphen P. This will be for our password. Uh, but you're not actually going to type your password yet, especially if you're streaming. Uh, I'm not going to type my password right now. So we'll do MySQL, username, and we're going to start with root. Uh, with your database, you can create multiple users, but for what we're doing in this class, we're not going to go that far, really. We're just going to use the root, and yeah, that's probably bad security, but whatever. Uh, so it's MySQL user hyphen name root, which is the root user. Typing pass passwords while streaming, yeah. And then hyphen P, oops, what did it not like? Hang on. Oh, sorry. User equals root. My bad. My mistake. And then we're going to type our password, which is rubber ducky. Oh, no. Actually, I'm just kidding. It's Hunter, too. And you will set up this password uh, when you install uh, MySQL. So that will get you uh, off the ground. And then from there, and I'm going to move my head out of the way. We are now in MySQL. The, you can think of this like being in the database, and we can start mucking around with things here. So what we're going to do is first, I'm going to shrink the size of this window and move it up a bit. We're actually going to take a step back and say what our database is going to look like. So you can think of database really just as a series of tables. So the idea is each table stores some information in rows and columns. Each row is a record of data. Each column is an attribute. And so for example, we may have, let's say, a table of courses. If we had a table of courses, that would include um, you know, a, a, a CRN, a course registration number. That is a, a number that uniquely identifies the course uh, specifically within databases. We're going to have a subject such as CS, a number such as 2501 like this course, and then a section number and a meeting time. So th this could be, and I'll move this out of the way for now, this could be what my database looks like. And you organize your database into a series of tables. Now the thing is, None of these tables exist on their own. We have to create them. So we're going to do that. But now I'm going to take a step back. I'm going to come over here to the whiteboard. Get this cat toy out of the way for now. All right. And we're going to discuss some database concepts. So if, for example, I have a course or a table called courses, and then I have fields like CRN, looks like an A, CRN, subject, number, this is the course number, so like 2501. Um, just, I'm, I, I, I lean over every once in a while to check to see if anyone has typed in chat, any questions. 
Uh, this is going to be our section number. And this is our meeting time. And let me give myself more space here. The first thing I need to state is I need to define one row that is going to unique or one column, excuse me, one column that will uniquely identify the different um, rows. That is to say every column or every record, excuse me, will be uniquely identifiable by the value in one column. So if I have my courses, which column would make the best unique identifier? And we have a word for this, and it's called the primary key. Well, subject is clearly not going to be a good unique identifier, right? Because I have, I mean, in, in the table I have up there, I already have four courses that are CS. So the subject's not going to be able to let me tell rows apart. Neither is the number because I have two uh, different sections with 2501 and they are actually different courses. One is DSA2, the other is uh, this course, SDE. The meeting time's obviously not going to be helpful because two courses could meet at the same time. So of the fields, the one that's left over is CRN, right? And the CRN, if you go on to uh, something like lose list, and we do, uh, you can just Google lose list CS, and you can see the courses that are being offered uh, next spring. You'll notice that right here, oh, enhanced too far, right here on the left for the courses, we have this number. This number is the CRN, and it's the number you need when you register for the course, right? This is the thing that uniquely identifies the course, and it, and it typically is a number. These unique identifiers are typically going to be numbers. And so, take a look here. I am going to define my CRN as the primary key. So I'm going to change this color here real quick. Um, highlighting this as my primary key. And the primary key is used to distinguish one row from another. That means to say that one row from every other row in the table. So the rules of the primary key are every row has to have a unique primary key. It cannot have the same primary key as any other row. For In layman's terms, I can't have two courses with the same CRN. The second constraint is that it's not null and it can't be blank. The thing about these tables is that I can leave some values blank unless I constrain the table to say otherwise. So I can leave some values blank. For example, you can leave a blank here for section number. I, I don't have a reason I would here, but SQL does allow for blanks in tables. And you'll see that I've actually already set a table up ahead of time, albeit we're going to um, we're going to delete it. And if you go into the MySQL Workbench application, go to the database I set up, which is SDE Day One, uh, and and when you run your script later, it will it will do this. Um, you can see I actually have a table here for students and a table here for courses where I've already populated some information. So these look like tables. These look not much different. You would think of them as Excel spreadsheets. But the key with SQL is it has its own language. And this language is very robust. It's very widely applicable. Most programming languages have a means to access SQL databases. Therefore, SQL databases are extremely portable, extremely portable. And that's another advantage. So let's actually head back 
to our command line. We're going to work through this at the same time as we work through our slides. So we've talked about how we have tables, we have records and columns. We have our primary key, which you should be familiar with that term. Now let's talk about data types. We have int, which is integer, double, which is double, decimal, which is kind of like double, but different. And then we have varchar, uh, which is int size. Now, what's the difference between double and decimal? Um, decimal is an exact value, so it is not represented like uh, the IEEE floating point standard. It uses mathematics differently, but if you're using monetary values, you generally should use uh, decimal. It's going to be more precise, but it's not floating point. Whereas to say the decimal can't move. Um, so like with a floating point number, for example, you'll have say eight, de eight, or eight decimal places. The decimal point doesn't have to be at the front or at the end. It can be anywhere in between with the decimal. Um, so for example, I could represent with double, say 23.4567 the same as I could also represent 0 0.568970 or 71. Six decimal places in both. In the case of decimal, if I were to say that this is uh, size 4, decimal point 2, then that means I could do 23.4, and let's round this up, 6, or I could do 0 0.57. That is to say, I have two decimal places uh, no matter what. Uh, so when you create a, the root password you create, you have to create what it considers at least a medium strength password. Uh, it's going to force you to do that. Um, and the, the reason for this is because it doesn't want you creating a database with the username root password password because that actually has caused a lot of problems to various companies over the year where someone when they were setting up the database did that and never changed it and then they made their database publicly accessible over the internet so other people in the company could access it and they've there's been a lot of problems to that believe it or not uh, so it's going to force you to make a a reasonably strong password uh, I'm I'm not gonna make suggestions off the top. I I'm a big proponent of pass phrases, which is to say uh, a large number of characters that are you know a large number of characters that maybe form some kind of unique, not normal phrase. By not normal, I mean not human readable, but something you'd be able to understand. There's a great XKCD comic on this. I can just pull it up real quick. Uh, XKCD strong password. And uh, it suggests things like correct horse battery staple. Yeah. UVA pays for the last pass premium. Is that a password manager? I've, I've always been happy with uh, the uh, Avast password manager myself. Okay. It's, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would strongly recommend just generally using a password manager um it it's to the point that you'll have so many accounts that you cannot reasonably remember all the unique passwords and um reusing passwords is a, a serious problem another xccd comic is great basically what will happen is some website will will actually get all their passwords dumped and then uh people will use those on like ebay or on Amazon, or on um, Venmo, to try to basically steal money or steal valuables. Anyway, so and then the big one that we're gonna the, so the one we're gonna use a lot is varchar, and varchar is basically the equivalent of string. So varchar effectively serves as our text. The thing about varchar is you have to specify the size. Uh, by default, I think the size will be 255. That means to say that uh, y there's a maximum size to your database uh, string information. You can't write strings larger than that. It will it will reject that. And the reason that you have to say this ahead of time 
is you can think of this similar to arrays. With Java arrays, you have to allocate how large the array is at the time of creation. Uh, with databases, you have to create, you have to allocate the amount of space for a record at the time the record's created. Um, and so it needs to know how much memory is required for each record. So these are our data types. We're mostly don't get too caught up on the difference between decimal and double. If you get stuck, just use double. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, at least for, for what we're doing now, because we're not going to get too, too deep into the weeds. This is just a starting point, so you see some SQL ahead of time. All right, so now let's say we want to create this table, the same table we had before. Well, in order to do this, I need to specify ahead of time what are my columns, which I have done, but what data types do I need for those commas? So things like int 5, what this tells me is this gives me space to store a number with five digits. Um, I, you don't have to, you can just say int. You don't have to say int 5, but this will be useful if you know you only need five digits. It will actually save you a bit of memory. It will make the presentation look a bit nicer too. Varkar 4, you do have to specify how large the Varkar is. In this case, a subject at UVA. I haven't seen any subjects that are larger than four characters. Uh, let me know if I'm wrong on that, and I'll increase it. The course number is typically four digits. The first digit typically indicating the, the year you take the course, and then the next three numbers uh, being unique to each department as to what they mean. Then we have our section, again, three digits. And then finally, our meeting time. And our meeting time, I'm not really doing any kind of strong format for. I could do things like a start time and an end time and, and, and go into more detail, but I'm going to pass on that for now and just say this is a string, varcar25. So we have identified we need an int, a varcar, whoops, a varcar, an int, an int, and a varcar. So now let's actually go to create the table. So we're going to pop back into our MySQL server. And from there, I'm going to say first that I need to set what database I want to use. So MySQL can hold multiple databases. I want to decide which database to use. So I'm going to use for the, for the sake of today, it's not a particularly creative name, I'm going to use... SDE day one. And that means that I'm inside the database that I've created for today's class. And in this database, I've actually already created some tables, but for now I'm going to delete them. And uh, if you're not familiar with um, this syntax, don't worry, you will be. Oop, drop, sorry drop table courses, drop table students. All right, sorry, had to, had to drop some tables to get us started. So right now we don't have any tables. So the first thing I wanna do is I want to create a table and actually have the command we're gonna use here. But I'm, we're gonna walk through it uh, one step at a time. So first thing is we're just going to say create table and then the name of our table in this case courses from here we then specify with an open parenthesis and by the way line breaks in sql you can put them wherever i'm going to specify with an open parenthesis this is where the columns or the fields of my tables starts and i'm just going to go through the same table i had here before Technically, we haven't added any, dable, any data to this yet, so I'm going to delete that. Let me shrink this window. So the fields that I have, the first one is, and we're going to write this as the name and then the data type. It's a bit backwards if you're used to Java or most imperative programming languages. So the name is CRN, and the data type is going to be int5, comma, 
we separate each field with a comma and you can separate it with a, a line break you don't have to i'm just doing this to make this a bit more readable so let me move my face down here for a second no i just want to move this window there we go subject var car four number int four section int three meeting and now you cannot actually have spaces in field names uh so i'm just gonna append them title case style meeting time var car 255 i'm then going to close my outer parenthesis that closes this parenthesis up here and then every command in my sequel needs to end with semicolon although actually i forgot the most important line i forgot so real quick if you cre if you ever need to delete a table it's just drop table and then the name of the table drop table courses there's an xkcd comic uh just google little bobby tables if you're not familiar with uh with it so real quick i'm going to create the table i'm going to use the same same input but i'm actually going to add uh can you do multi-threaded operations um you can actually so if you look the database the um, and I'll, I'll need to blow this up here real quick the database has if you go into the mysql workbench there's a way to see the uh the database current status um can't remember where it is exactly There's a way to see the database status, but I can't remember. Theria server status. And you can see uh, how much my server, which is just, I mean, there's my server right there. Um, the server is running on this computer. It's not, by the way, there are dedicated SQL servers. It's just that this one's not for obvious reasons. Uh, but you can do multi, multi threaded operations. Uh, you typically do it by just accessing the server with different threads. Slap proof server. This baby can fit so many records into it. Exactly right. Um, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, the, the thing that I forgot, which is really important, is we also need to specify what our primary key is. And that's a big one. And it's silly that I forgot. Primary key is going to be crn we're spe saying that our field primary or our field crn is going to serve not as the primary underscore key excuse me just primary key and what this means is that this field is going to serve as the unique identifier uh, for each row and now we've created our table and if i go back to my database and I look under tables, you can see, oh, look, here's courses. Right now, I don't have any data in it. But if you look on your MySQL workbench, you should see it there. Now, yes, you can, by the way, edit the table in here. But we're programmers. We, we don't need we don't need no stinking GUI. So we have our table, but currently it's empty. So the next thing we need to do is add data to it. And we're going to add data to it with the insert into command. So insert into courses, and actually let me uh, let me one two three four five. Sorry, I make sure I actually did the right uh, syntax here. I match up the the two things. So we're just going to use this command insert into, and what I want to illustrate. Oops. And by the way, I just right click and it'll, it'll paste and run. But what this is, is this insert statement is saying what values to insert into a given record. So for example, I have here one, two, three, four, five. That coordinates with the first column, CRN. 
So the fields have to be in the same order as the columns in this case. So CRN, one, two, three, four, five, subject, CS, number, 2501, section, 300, and meeting time, Tuesday, Thursday, 1230 to 145. From there, I can insert multiple values at the same time doing something like this. This command, if you'll notice, has two different sets of parentheses. What would it look like if you wanted one of the fields to be blank? Um, we'll get there. We can't do it this way, but I have an example that we'll get to later. I want to at least just get all the the bedrock laid in before we start doing any of the, the weirder stuff we might want to add. So if I wanted to add two more sections, <coughs> I would use this command. And this is going to allow me, again, insert into courses values. We still have that. But you can think of each parenthesis group as a separate record. And because our table has five columns, we're going to put five things into it. So I'm just going to copy this line, come over to my server, and paste it. Didn't paste. Hang on. That's weird. It's not pasting. Normally, right-click is paste. There we go. It was weird. Um, so now, notice I added in two rows. Now, let's do select star from courses. We'll talk about what that means in a second. But just to show you, my data that I've added is here. This is another way to view it. And we'll talk about what select means in just a second. But now I've added data. Now I want to show what happens if I try to add something illegal. By that I mean, let's say I try to insert a course that already exists. Notice 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is here. Even if it's a different, um, even if it's a different subject, let's say uh, APMA. If I try to insert this, I get a chime and an error, duplicate entry for the primary key. What this means is we cannot insert data that violates the rule of our primary key, which is to say our primary key must be unique and not null. So the primary key must be unique if you try to add data to a database uh, that violates that constraint, it will reject it. Any questions so far about just adding? Uh, can you change the primary key after the table has been created? Yes, but not easily. And I, I'm I'm not. So here's here is the God's honest truth. I have been using SQL for years. I would have to Google how to do that. Because I really go out, I I really 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 go out of my way to not do that. There's a there's a uh, the statement is alter table. I know that. Uh, that so there's like you know you know there's drop table, there's select, there's insert. It's alter table, but I don't remember the rest of the command because I really really go out of my way to avoid using it when possible. Uh, because it's a massive pain, especially changing the primary key because you have to then sanitize the database before you change the primary key to make sure the row you're switching to wouldn't violate the primary key constraint. It's a whole thing. So you can do it. I, I, I would go out of my way to make sure I don't have to. All right. So now let's get into querying. Uh, querying is the is how you extract information from the table, and the and the simplest query is going to be select star from the name of your table. In this case, courses, and it just is going to print all of the information, and it's actually a pretty nice print scheme. Um, 
It's going to print all the information, so every column and every record. From there, we can constrain this. Let's say I only want the subject and the course number. Well, instead of select star, you can think of star as a wildcard, meaning select everything. I can instead do subject, comma, number. And that's only going to select the subject column and the number column. And if I do that, you'll see this is the table I get. So this allows you to filter what fields you want to see. But again, if you want to see everything, it's just select star. So the format is select blank from blank. From there, we go, um, and how am I doing on time? Okay, we're, we're fine on time for now. From there, we can now do some additional limitations. We can do a filtered query using what is called the where keyword. And the where keyword kind of acts as a Boolean check. If you remember when we did Java streams, we had that filter function, right? That said, hey, if you don't meet this filter, you're kicked out of the stream. Well, that's what this is like. This is exactly like that. And if anything, it, it's, it's quite a bit simpler to work with. I can do something like select star from courses where subject equals CS. And now notice, instead of seeing all three rows of our table, like we do up here when we do select star. By the way, you'll see me do this a lot, and it's just because I forget to type semicolon. Will it accept regex? Let's find out. I actually, I've, I've never tried. Let's do select S star. No, that doesn't work. At least not that I'm aware of. Um, I tried. Because um, I, I thought maybe that would give me subject and section. I will say that I, I've, I've not tried to do that. I've either taken everything or I've taken specific columns. I've never, I've never tried to be so creative as to use regex in... Um, at least, I mean, I have in the data, but I do that usually after I download the data from the database into a programming contract. If you put section int four, would it be possible? Would it possibly get confused with the course numbers? Uh, well, so the reason um, rem the the way SQL tells apart the columns is by their name. That would be like saying in, in Java if I had two ints would Java get them confused? Well, if, if they have different variable names, no, Java won't get them confused. Um, so it wouldn't get confused with the course numbers. The The reason I have four is just because that's based on my experience here. If I, if I were teaching this lecture at Penn, uh, there at Penn, all the course numbers have three numbers. Uh, they're not four numbers. So it's things like uh, 110 or uh, 120 or... 250 or 350 or whatever um so that's you know university dependent but even then uh it wouldn't get confused now so if i just select star from courses where subject to cs you're just only going to see the records that adhere to that constraint and you can add things with or Subject equals APMA. You can also do something like and section equals 300. And you'll notice that I use quotes anytime I'm looking at a VAR car, and I use no quotes when I'm talking about a number field. Uh, you can also use greater than or less than, so section less than 300. You'll see that's what I get. Um, so the where keyword is, is just a, a very straightforward filter. It allows you to select a subset of, of records. Any questions so far?
All right. Now we're going to get into update and deleting. And this is where I say, by default, someone clipped this, what I'm about to say. I'll give you a minute after I say it to clip it because this is really, really, really important. By default, in MySQL, when you install it, it auto commits everything you do. And that's bad. That's really, really bad. For example, right now, if I were to say delete from courses, if I were to hit enter right now, I would lose all of my table, all of it, literally the entire table. So this is something you should really, really do. And I have this in the slide. Um, set auto commit equal to zero. Paste this in. This should be like the first thing you do. Set auto commit. Keep mistyping here. Commit equals zero. And uh, in, in SQL, numbers can be treated like uh, Booleans, the same as Python. Zero means false. One means true. Technically, not zero means true. Set auto commit zero. And the reason is I do not want what I'm about to do to auto commit. And you should just always have that setting. Should never allow auto commit. What you can do at any given point is you can say commit. And this creates a checkpoint in your database. So if I accidentally do something stupid like, and there's uh, this command delete from courses. And I could do something like delete from courses where CRN equals one, two, three, four, five. And if I select star from courses, you'll now see that I've deleted the course previously that was up here. Here's the table, CRN12345. You'll see that that has now been deleted. And it's been deleted because delete from courses, CRN that. It's, it's the same as a select statement, except instead of printing what you select, you delete what you select but you can't undo that there's no undo unless you commit ahead of time and then you can roll back select uh it doesn't need the star no select star from courses so the the reason delete doesn't have a star Yeah, you can always, dis well, because sometimes you might need to modify uh, the database. And yes, you can open it uh, from um, read-only mode. It often makes sense to give uh, some users only read access to the database, not edit access. But that's, anything like that is, is well beyond the scope of this course. That would be in more of a databases class. This is a crash course. Um why does delete not have the star? The reason is, remember that when I say select, I'm selecting which columns to show. Subject, number, from, courses. It does not make sense for me to say delete, subject, number, from, courses. Where CRN equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Doesn't really make sense for me to do that. Because I'm, I'm going to delete the entire row when I delete a row. So if I want to delete this row, I'm just going to just say delete. I don't need to specify which columns because it's the entire row that I'm deleting. Delete uh, or delete from courses where CRN equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Select star from courses, you'll see it's deleted. If you accidentally do this, delete from courses, you have just deleted your entire database. Or not your entire database, sorry, your entire table. It's empty now. So anytime you are about to use, anytime you are about to do anything with a delete, anything at all really anything at all with a delete do yourself a favor and create that commit point 
that I showed earlier, create the commit, then do the change. If you make a mistake, you can roll back. And if at the end you're satisfied with the change, then you can just commit again. But do yourself a favor. This is where I tell you that uh, we use database. We use uh, databases to manage my intro programming class at Penn, CIS 110. And I accidentally did something like this. And we had to make every student resubmit a homework assignment because of a mistake that I made. So uh, don't do that. Anyway, um, from there, so that's that. Uh, from there, the last one I'm going to show is update. I'm going to update courses. This will allow me to, let's say, change a meeting time. So update courses, set meeting time equal, and let's say, let's say for whatever reason this course were changed to be meeting at 2 p.m. rather than 1 p.m. It's not happening. I'm just saying, like, let's hypothetically say, how would we do that in our database? So this would be 2.30 to 3.45 I'm going to set that where CRN equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And it's important that each of these parts be dissected. So first we're saying we're going to make changes to our table. We're not adding new rows. We're not deleting any rows. We're changing existing rows. This is the change we're going to make. We're going to set the meeting time equal to this string, but we're only doing it on the row I want, specifically the row where CRN is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And if I did this correctly, which I did, select star from courses. And there we go. Now, at this point, you may be thinking, wow, I have to do all this in command line? And the answer is no, you don't you can create what are called SQL files. And a SQL file looks something like this. This is a SQL file. And this is a SQL file that I use to build and populate two tables. I have courses and I have students. Now, before I populate them, I'm going to call drop table courses and students to delete any tables I have. This is going to put my database into the initial state. I'm then going to create the same courses table I had before, populate it with the same data. I'm then going to create my table students, and I populate it with data in two different ways, and we'll get to these two lines in a second. This file is saved, just to show you where it's saved, it's saved into a folder called SQL, which is in my My Documents folder, and it is called init.sql. I-N-I-T, short for initialization. You don't have to call it in it. You could call it Steve. Steve.sql is a completely fine name. Call it anything you want. But I'm going to remind you that, I'm going to scroll all the way back up to the top, I was in this folder. Here I am when I opened my SQL. So because I was in that folder when I opened my SQL, I can access this file through the command source init.sql. And that is going to run this file like a script. It's going to run it as though I enter all of these lines into the command line one after the other in order. And the advantage of this is that this gives me a situation where I can put everything in one place. I can test and build this script. And I can do this all separate from the command line which you really can't do a lot of uh, good editing in the command line. Uh, is there an equivalent to see the script in the directory you're in? What do you... To see the scripts available? Um, not that I'm familiar with. The only way I could think would be to do ls, but that's not a MySQL command. So you'd have to do something like exit, which you could do. Exit leaves. Oh, ls, sorry, yeah. And then you could do an ls, 
I'm not familiar with any way to do that within SQL, but then you can come back up, type in your password, which once again is Hunter2. It's just a very, very long way of typing Hunter2. And then, to my knowledge, there's no way in here. If you find it, certainly let me know. But this is going to let me write and call scripts. Oops. First, you have to be in your database. So use SDE day one. And by, not user, use SDE day one. Sorry. And then run my script. And there we go. And this is useful because now notice I have all my data entry over here. So if for whatever reason I lose my table, I've saved all that information there. Then I can do select star from students. And you'll see something interesting here, which we'll get into in a second. And then select star from courses. Could your script disable auto commit? Um, yeah, you could disable auto commit. All you would need to do in your script is do set auto commit equals one. And then if you want to reset it at the end, down here at the end of your script, you can do set auto commit equal to zero. And, and I would, I, oh, sorry, I'm blocking that, aren't I? No, I'm not. Yeah, you can see that. That's how I would do it. And it, and this is the advantage of scripts, is it lets you do these things uh, fairly simply. So if you've ever written like a bash script before, you really, it's, it's not, this is not code. You don't compile this. This is interpreted. So it's a script. Uh, so it, it live runs each step in order. But then from there, uh, so I have my table for students i have my table for courses we'll talk about how we'll combine these two tables into one table on thursday uh, but i want to illustrate how this table students was created because there are some interesting things in here so i'm going to scroll down and i want to point out a couple things first and foremost we can have um added constraints to each column so there's a number of constraints that you can add. First, you specify the data type, but then there are constraints such as not null. Not null means this value is not allowed to be blank. It's not allowed to be empty. Every row has to create it. So I say a student's last name and their student number have to be not null. And if a student is a, has a mononym, which is to say a single name, then we make them put it in their last name field. I also have this thing auto increment auto increment is useful what it does is every time you add a row to your table it inserts the value the next available number um basically one plus whatever the last data was this is going to be valuable for generating student numbers for example and then from there i set the primary key to student number now notice down here i'm saying insert into students last name first name class year i am specifying here that i'm populating three fields manually that is i'm going to enter three notice i didn't have student number but student number was my primary key is that okay can i do that it is because of this auto increment so what this will do is the first student inserted will be given the ID one and you can set a default starting value, but I'm not going to get into that right now. The second student will be given two, the third student will be given three and so on. And if you take a look, that's exactly what happened. John Smith got student number one, Deborah Jones got student number two, Jack Black got student number three. In addition to this, so this was how do we insert into a table such that it can create blanks. Let's say I say insert in table students first name, last name, or last name, first name, and I say white Jack, so Jack White in this case. Because I do not specify class year, it is going to leave that blank. Now, I could do something like default equals one and if i do this in my script
Oh, it doesn't like. Um, hang on, give me a second. I, I if, one sec. Sorry, you don't say equals one. You just say default one. That was my mistake. I had that in my notes and I just forgot. Uh, so you just say default one. Rerun that script. And then select star from students. And there we go. You can see that by default, Jack White is a first year. By the way, did you know that Jack Black, the actor's parents, were professors? Something to, for me to aspire to with my children, I guess. Anyway, so I will upload this script and these slides uh, to the collab immediately after lecture ends. But that's our starting point. On Wednesday, or excuse me, on Thursday, on Thursday, we are going to do... Uh, relationships between tables we're going to do join queries and then we're going to look at jdbc this is a way to do java queries java database queries uh from a java environment and then from there that will prepare you for homework six which again the idea of homework six is json to java we're going to import it into java upload it to a database then we're going to run a query, download that into Java, and output that to a JSON file. So that's going to be homework six, and it's not going to be big. It's probably going to be, in terms of amount of code, well, I guess, I mean, it, you didn't write any code in homework four, so the second least code writing that you'll do. Uh, in any assignment if i if i if i write it correctly which i'm hoping to do uh so that will be out uh on thursday as will a quiz um remember that there is going to be a quiz six i haven't actually put it on collab yet but there's not going to be any questions and everyone's going to get 10 out of 10 points yay so uh look forward to that any any last questions before we uh wrap up for the day Okay, well, before we go, there's one thing I, I'm, people have been requesting this, so. Stuart Cam. Uh, no, that's not going to balance. Stuart Cam. Look at that sleepy boy. Play your guitar, please. Uh, no, <laughs> no, thank you. I will, I will pass. I'm, I'm not that good. I was in a punk rock band in high school, but I'm not that good. So, any other questions? Otherwise, I'll just keep it on Stuart Cam. Also, I know the color's a bit off. Uh, the reason the color's off is it makes the whiteboard appear better because this is my whiteboard camera. All right. Well, then I will see everyone on Thursday. Take care. I give the people what they want, and what they want is cats. <laughs>